faith arise. arise in us. Hallelujah. Give him a hand. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, you may be seated. Kids class can be released at this time. And we got some drums going on. Wow. That was interesting. See there, Andreas, you can be replaced by a box. <laughs> Amen. Let faith arise. Wow. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Everybody got excited, didn't they, about that, man? That was good stuff, man. You could tell we just entered into worship on that one, wasn't it, man? That's good. 
That's good. Hey, I want to talk to you about storms. Anybody here ever been in a storm? Yeah. Amen. Oh, man. Yeah. I want to talk to you about the storms of life. Okay? Not just the hurricanes, not just the typhoons that we may have to endure, not just the thunderstorms, not the lightning that we have to dodge while we're out there weed-eating yards or anything like that, but the storms of life. And I want to share with you that everybody here is either in one place or another in a storm. You're either A, in the middle of a storm right now, amen, or either you're emerging from a storm or you're about to go through a storm <laughs> because there are storms in our life that constantly come. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, everything's just going smooth. Everything's just kind of just, you got everything lined up. It's just in place. And then all of a sudden, there's a knock on your door. There's a letter in the mail. There's a phone call from a doctor that says, hey, you need to come in. We need to talk. There's a look from your boss that looks kind of cross, followed by, I need to see you in my office. Yeah, these storms, they just come out of nowhere. And the one thing you need to understand is there's no respecter of persons at all. It doesn't matter whether you're fat or thin, rich or poor, ugly or pretty. It doesn't matter. Not that there's anybody ugly in here. Amen. See that, Amy? I said, well, y'all are asleep without art, man. We need art here today. Amen. Art would be going off right now. Wouldn't it? Amen. 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 Okay. <laughs> Storms are part of everyday life. They are. It's part of everyday life. In fact, you're going to go through storms until the day you check out. And when you finally get to check out and you get to check into heaven, the storm will be over then. Amen? Amen. But they're going to come. Like I said, you're either in the middle of a storm right now, you're either emerging from a storm, or you're about to go through a storm. So your minds will be prepared. They come without warning. Just out of nowhere. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. Okay. They come without warning from nowhere on a continual basis. And that's what I want to talk to you today about is the storm. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And we're going to read this whole segment here, and then we're going to go back over it. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And the same day, when the even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and said unto him, Master, Carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said unto one another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, I want you to understand something. Before this incident happens, Jesus is out there spending the day on, on the pier, on the point of a ship, speaking to the crowd about soil, about farming techniques, about casting seed, and sometimes it following, falling on good soil, sometimes on the wayside, and sometimes on rocky and thorny ground. He had spent the day teaching and sharing about soil. Now, his disciples had been with him at, you know, some time now, and they had seen miracles. They had seen God's hand of intervention. They had seen God move. They knew that he had all instruction for life. They knew that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, here they are on a ship, and a storm arises. Jesus is fast asleep. Th there's a picture that you've got to kind of follow along with me here. We have the disciples in the ship. We have Jesus in the ship. The disciples are, well, for lack of better explanation, freaking out because there is a huge storm taking place. But Jesus is fast asleep. We read later that disciples come up to him and say, don't you care? 
How many of you think that Jesus just didn't care about the storm as why he was fast asleep? Nobody thinks that, right? How could Jesus sleep in the middle of a storm? Oh, y'all wasn't expecting interaction this morning. I'm sorry. Let's try it again. How is it that Jesus was fast asleep in the middle of a storm? Because he knew who was in charge. Amen? See, this is something I want you to understand before we go any further is that Jesus knows who's in charge of the storm that you're in right now. Amen? Do you understand that? The storm is not in control of you. Amen? Jesus is in control of the storm. In fact, it says here, it says the, the storm... Well, you know, we've got to learn something about the storm. Storms have a tendency to kind of reveal our heart. Think about the disciples here for a minute. They had been with Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. They knew Jesus was in control of many things, both physical, supernatural. They knew this. And yet here was a storm that arose, and they freaked out. They lost control. They just could not understand why this was happening to them. So storms have a way of revealing our heart. See, honestly, let someone jump down your throat and see how you respond. Do you respond in love and mercy and grace? Is Jesus controlling your life? You can easily find out by the, how you respond to somebody getting on to you. Amen? I ain't getting no amens hardly on that. Amen? Okay. Let a financial crisis happen. All of a sudden, there's just not enough men, money to pay the electric bill. Let's see how you respond then. Are you trusting the Lord? Are you leaning to him? Are you looking to him? Are you doing everything possible that you can do to make ends meet but trusting him? Are you freaking out? Are you losing control? Are you losing your faith? Does the blame game start to happen? <laughs> yeah, you know the blame game where you start blaming everybody else for your problem. If my boss would have just gave me some more hours, I would have been able to pay my bill. But maybe if you did your job a little bit better, you would get more hours. Amen? Amen. Come on now. Amen. Some of y'all been in management. You know how to do the power of the pen. Well, you ain't doing your job. Let's just cut the hours. Okay. Maybe, maybe the blame isn't on everybody else, but steadily, fastly who you're looking at in the mirror. Is your life producing a crop? I mean, is there fruit? Is there evidence of a relationship with Christ in your life? Or are you just kind of missing the mark and just going through? Some of us probably feel like that ship that's in the middle of the storm being tossed this way and that way, blown down this path, then blown down that path, about the capsize from time to time because we're just in the middle of a constant storm. The storms reveal something about our faith based on our response. We need to be at the point in place where we understand that the master is in control. And when we look to him and lean to him, that he can take us through this storm. Let's go back to verse 37 real quick. Let's read it. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. When a storm comes, what do you do? Well, you do just what the disciples did, right? You do everything you can do not to, you know, be capsized, right? Yeah, you hang on. You hold on. You grasp hold of the ride. I mean, you, you do what you know how to do based on your own experiences. In fact, we had some sailors on that ship when that storm arose. And I'm sure they did all that they could do. I'm sure they quickly lowered the sails. They brought out the oars. They were experienced fishermen, so they knew what to do. They probably put the, rows, the oars in the water, and they held the boat, kept it facing the wind, and pulled together and tried to keep it as steady as possible. They were doing everything they could in their power to overcome that storm. Many of us in this room are doing everything we can do right now within our power to overcome a storm. Man, life has hit us, blindsided us. It has almost capsized us. We're doing all we can do to hold on based off what we know. Unfortunately, sometimes in a storm, that's not enough. They knew what to do. 
You know, a storm not only has the benefit of revealing your faith, but it also has the benefit of making you grow. Amen? When, when you can go through something in life and come out the other side, having had faith in Christ to see you through it, you build that faith, and next time when a storm comes up, it doesn't knock you quite for such a loop as it did the first time. Amen? In fact, we grow. We learn. We mature. In fact, somewhere between ordinary and extraordinary is a storm. See, you'll never become an extraordinary person. You'll never become a man or a woman of faith, a leader, a director, a teacher, someone that God can use without going through something yourself. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all are in a really good spot because you've been through so much. Man, God's going to be able to use you a lot. Amen? Amen? Somewhere between ordinary and extraordinary is something called trouble, a storm. Somewhere between average and greatness is a storm as well. How many of y'all want to be great in the kingdom of God? Amen? Amen. I figured I'd get a little bit better response than that. Amen. How many of y'all want to be okay in the kingdom of God? Okay, how many of y'all want to be great in the kingdom of God? Amen. Amen. Right? I mean, it should be the whole church want to be great in the kingdom of God. Amen. What other purpose do we have on this earth? Besides being fruitful and multiply, right? <laughs> I took that scripture literally. That's why I have seven kids. Okay? Uh, Skill, <laughs> skilled mariners, skilled mariners are not produced on glassy seas, are they? I mean, come on, we live in a fishing community, don't we? Any of y'all ever been out there on a boat in the sea? Yeah, a few of us have, right? Yeah, I mean, think about this. You don't become a skilled mariner on a glassy sea. It is when the storms arise that you learn some skills, Amen. God is trying to teach you something. I want to tell you, if you're going through a storm right now, or if you're emerging a storm, or if you're about to go through a storm, God is trying to teach you something. Amen? Amen. There's something he wants you to learn, something he wants you to experience, something he wants you to come the other side out of that storm, knowing that you didn't know when you went into the storm. Amen? Amen. A storm can develop you if you'll trust the Lord. See, our days will be filled with gut-wrenching. Nerve ending, sleep stealing problems. They will. But we got one who's above all that. We've got a creator, we've got a master who's above every last one of those situations. It doesn't matter what your occupation is, it doesn't matter what you do in life, you will experience storms. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. You will go through a storm, and it is an opportunity to grow. And we just talked about the disciples being experienced fishermen, amen? And knowing how to let the sails down, how to keep the oars in the water and the, their hands firm on the rudder and keeping the water out of the boat. And I want you to think of this. You know, that verse 37 says... Um, the, the, the waves beat the ship so that it was now full. If you're in a ship and it's full of water, what is the first thing you do? You get some buckets and you start bailing, right? Hopefully the first thing you do is pray. Yeah? And the second thing you do is you start bailing water. I mean, you, you, you got to imagine this. I mean, we just read these stories sometimes in these events and we think, oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. But we never try to imagine what, the, what it actually looked like, what it was like to be there in that situation, to be one of those disciples, to be one of those individuals in that boat, and that storm to rise up out of nowhere, and for Jesus to be fast asleep in the back, and for you to be doing everything you possibly can do to make it through, to make sure that you survive, to the fact that the, point, the water has now filled the boat, and the boat's about full, and sinking, it is going down, and everybody on the boat's now got all the buckets of pots and pans and clay pots and everything else they could find, and they're bailing the water out, trying to throw the water out, and they're just about to freak out because it looks like it is the end. We often do the same thing. 
I mean, we're in there, we're bailing, we're bailing, we're bailing, we're holding on, we're doing the best we can do. Some of us really put our, our, our faith and trust in the wrong things. I mean, we really do. We put our faith and trust in a good insurance plan. Yeah. I mean, we do. We, we got to have enough insurance, life insurance, so if we check out, our family could be provided for, right? In fact, I'm worth more dead than I am alive, but I don't put my trust and my faith in my good insurance plan. I put my trust and my faith in my Lord. We put our trust and faith in a job. And there's something that you ought to know by now, especially in this economy that we're in, there is no guarantee of having a job tomorrow, amen? I mean, things are subject to change. So sometimes we put our faith and trust in a good bank account. Anybody ever done that? <laughs> Guess what happens to that bank account? It dwindles down quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. Many times we have all these things, insurance plans and jobs and bank accounts and money saved and dependable cars. And we think that, you know what? If a problem arises, I'm just going to go take care of it. I'm just going to go take care of it. Yeah. We've got to understand God wants to take care of it. God wants to take care of you. Whatever storm you're going through right now, you don't need to put your faith and trust in your power and your ability to overcome it. You need to put your faith and your trust in God's ability to overcome it. God simply needs us to trust him, to give it to him. Even though they had all this, the boat was still filling with water. It was still sinking. Even though they had all the experience, all the knowledge, all the know-how, the boat was still sinking. So one thing I've learned in life is the longer it takes me to put my faith and trust in God, the longer the storm stays present. The longer it takes me to get to the end of myself, the more that storm is going to rage and it's going to roll. In fact, if it takes me too long, I may get hit by another storm from the other side. And then from the front and from the back and from the east and from the west, from every side, I'm getting hit from a storm. Because God wants me to be the end of myself to where I can trust him and he can see me through it. Amen. Storm will draw you to the only real help. Not only will it cause you to grow, not only will it give you opportunity for growth, it will cause you to reach out to the only real help there is. Think of it. There was at least 13 men in this boat. One was asleep. We know who he was, right? Four were accomplished sailors. And eight were probably sitting back watching it all happen. Probably not too worried, figuring that Peter and the boys were going to be able to get them out of this mess since they knew how to fish, you know. They had been on ships. And I'm sure there was a point that after they seen the, the, the fear on Peter's face, that they themselves, those other eight sitting in the boat, kind of got a little discouraged and figured, well, they better get a bucket too and start bailing as well because it looked like something detrimental was about to happen. Oftentimes the church is like that, isn't it? Man, we sit back, we wait on the pastor to do it. We wait on the spiritual leader to do it. We wait on somebody else to fast. We wait on somebody else to pray. We wait on somebody else to do the job. We're just kind of sitting back in the seat, sitting back in the, we had pews, I'd say pews, pews, not doing much, but just watching, just kind of along for the ride while the storm is raging from the east, while the storm is raging from the west, while it's coming from the north, while it's coming from the south, while the boat's about to sink, we're sitting back doing nothing, waiting on somebody else to take care of it. That's complacency. And really, there's no room for complacency in the church. Because if you come here as a member, if you come here as a visitor, and you just sit back in that seat and do nothing but be a spectator, you're missing the whole point of church. Amen? The church is the body of Christ getting involved to reach its community to share the gospel message with those that are lost. It's not about being entertained. I mean, it's nice we got flashy red and blue and green lights and all that kind of stuff. And probably at the new church, we even have a fog machine and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it'd be nice, you know. Yeah, we know who knows. We may come up out of the floor, you know. Who knows what we're going to do, you know. Maybe fly down from the sky, you know, on cables. and uh. Yeah, Spider-Man, right? now. Listen, church isn't about entertainment. It's about a body of believers making a difference for the gospel, for the kingdom. You see, when the skilled sailors get worried, 
It's time to have a little fear yourself. That storm, that moment on the boat, when those four experienced fishermen were completely fearful and worried, when the eight others had finally jumped in and started doing something themselves because they were getting worried. And Jesus is still asleep. I want you to understand, that storm was not a bad thing. In fact, I'd venture to say that whatever you're going through in life right now, whatever storm has arose in your life right now, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And think about it. Jacob had the birthright. He did. It belonged to him. Esau sold it to him. But it took an angry brother to motivate him to take charge of it. Joseph had tremendous dreams, but it took a band of murderous brothers to bring those dreams to fulfillment. I mean, think of this. Hannah had to deal with insults, but it was those insults that sent her to the temple. Moses had to sit on the backside of the desert for 40 years before he could be brought in to God's purpose. Whatever storm that has brought you to Promised Land Ministries, whatever storm you're going through in life right now, could be solely God's hand in getting you where you need to be. Amen? Amen. Getting you where he can use you. You see, it takes a storm for us to get a measure of faith. When everything's just going honky-dory, we tend to forget about doing what we need to do. Man, when everything's just going smooth, and it's smooth sailing, we kind of think, well, maybe I don't need to pray so much anymore. Or maybe I don't need to spend that much time in the Word anymore, you know. But let a storm arise, and we'll drop to our knees, and we'll start screaming and crying and praying and going, oh, God, why would you let this happen? And he's sitting there saying, so you could do this. Duh. <laughs> you know? So you would call me, so you would look to me. See, we need to understand that the remedies of the storm are not earthbound, but heavenbound. That's what we've got to come to understanding of. It's not so much importance what happens to us as what happens in us that matters. Think of that. You know, one day it's all going to be over with. One day, one day it's all going to be said and done. Every last one of us are going to check out, unless Jesus comes back first and then we're all checking out with him, amen? Every last one of us one day is going to pass away. The minute you are born, you begin to die. It's coming. You will not live forever except for eternity in heaven, amen? Really? What is so important about the things that take place on this earth if you're only here but a short amount of time? Why is it we spend so much effort, so much energy, so much of our time that God has given us as a gift trying to make it in this world in so little time of shoring up our eternity? Our focus is wrong. See, a storm will give us opportunity to grow. A storm will draw us to our only real help. And a storm will bring you to your knees. And that's where we need to be. Verse 38 tells us, And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They had finally reached a place where they knew they could no longer take care of it themselves. They had finally got to the end of themselves. Here they were. The storm was pounding them and pounding them and pounding them. The boat was filling with water. They had bailed until they could bail no more. And when they finally gave up, they called out to the master. And the master awoke. Are you there yet? 
Have you gotten on your knees yet? Have you cried out and called out to the master? Are you reaching out to the only real help? Are you still in the midst of bailing out a sinking ship? Are you still out there sticking the rows, the oars in the water, trying to hold it, keeping it steadfast in the wind? Are you still trying to accomplish it on your own? Because if you are, I promise you, it will only get worse until you learn to cry out to the master. We need to cry out to him in repentance. Amen? Amen. Not necessarily repentance for the storm. We get that wrong sometimes. You know what? Honestly, I'm just going to be honest with you. Many of the storms that I've went through in my life, I have brought them on myself. Amen? Amen. By my own attitudes. By my own sin. By my own hang-ups and my own problems. Many of the storms I've went through, in fact, most of the storms I've gone through, I have brought them on myself. And when I say repentance, yes, we need to repent for the things we've done wrong. But you know what? Again, I've got to tell you, I thank God for every last storm I've been through. Because if I hadn't been through the storm, I wouldn't know how to come out the other side dependent upon Jesus. So I thank God for storms. So I'm not, when I say repentance, yes, you need to ask God forgiveness for your sin. You need to do an about face. You need to no longer participate in those things. But what I'm talking about is repenting for trying to take care of it yourself. You need to repent. I need to repent for trying to do it in my own power, by my own will, by my own might, because I honestly don't have anything to offer but what God has got to give me. Amen? Amen. We need to repent for trying to handle the storm and navigate the storm without him for doing it our way. Again, the storm is an okay place to be. It is. Because without great affliction, there can't be great success. If you've never been down a rocky road, you don't know how to tell anybody else how to navigate a rocky road. Amen? Think of it. Pentecost hit in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit came down. And immediately persecution followed. Peter preached the first sermon where 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom. And almost immediately after that was imprisoned. Think of it. There's always a storm. In fact, the disciples themselves experienced the greatest calm they ever known. Just before the largest hurricane they had ever experienced was about to hit. So when it gets too calm, watch out. <laughs> when it gets too calm, watch out. If you want the sun to stand still, you've got to be in a fight first, amen? You do. If you want the water to be sweet, you've got to try the bitter water first, amen? We've got to go through the storm in order to experience what God wants us to know. If you want manna to fall from heaven, you got to be hungry first. You got to be so hungry that you cry out to God. There has to be no other way because that's how we are. We got to get to the end of ourselves. There has to be no other way for you to be fed. And then when you're hungry enough and you're tired enough and you hurt enough and you've been through the storm enough and you're tired of being beat up enough, you will finally cry out to God and he will meet your need. He has proven it again and again and again. If you want fire to fall from heaven, you've got to be surrounded by people that doubt. If you want to see victory, you may have to first go through defeat to the end of yourself. Having the storm will bring you to your knees, and that is a crucial place of prayer where God desires each and every one of us to reach. They did. It says verse 38, where did it go? thought it was up there. It, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow, and they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
when it's finally enough, you'll get on your knees and you will cry out. Lord, Lord, I'm here. Lord, I need you. Lord Jesus, help me. And when you finally get there and he reaches down and he touches the place where you are, he comes out and he says in verse 39, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Do you want peace? Do you want peace in your life? In the midst of the storm that you're facing right now, sickness, job, financial, loved ones, marital problems, whatever it may be, whatever the storm is, maybe problems with your children, whatever the problem is, do you want peace? Do you want it to be still? Do you want the wind to cease? Do you want the storm to stop? If you do, you must cry out to the master. And he will answer you. He will answer you. Aaron Lutzer says, God often puts us in situations that are too much for us so that we will learn there is no situation too much for him. God often puts us in situations that are too much for us so that we can learn there is nothing too much for him. I don't know what everybody's facing here today. I don't know what you'll be facing tomorrow. I don't know what kind of storm is going to rise up in your life. I don't know how difficult it may be. And I don't know that you may not sustain injury in the storm because oftentimes we are. But I do know this, if you will call on the master, he will hear your call. If you will cry out to him, he will see you through the storm. And he will bring you to the other side. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. It is so the storm can bring him glory. God wants glory in your life. And if you will give him the storm that you're in, he will receive that glory. What greater glory? Can God have than to rise up and speak to the storm in your life and say, peace, be still, and for the storm to cease. Peace, be still, so the storm can cease. Verse 40, Jesus responds, and he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? That's my question for you today. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why are you so fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? Some of you in this room may be doubting what God has called you to do. You may be wondering, are you really cut out for this? Why are you so fearful? Do you have no faith? Some of you are struggling, struggling financial problems today. You don't know how you're going to make your next bill. Why are you so fearful? Do you have no faith? Some of you are having problems with your children today. They're driving you to your wits end. I can relate. Why are you so fearful? <laughs> Do you have so little faith? Do you have no faith? Maybe you have sickness. Maybe you're in pain. Maybe you don't know which way to turn. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I want you to understand something as we draw this to a conclusion. I want you to understand that this message is about trusting Jesus for the storm. It's not about not going through the storm because you're going to go through it. And if you're not in one now, you'll be going through it. And if you're not about to go through one, then you're just coming out of one. One way or the other, there's a storm coming up in your life. And it's a good thing because God will grow you in that storm. I want you to understand God's control is absolute. It reaches every detail of your life. 
Not only the big storms that rise up, but even in the daily little sprinkles that come and shower us down. God's control is absolute. And because his control is absolute, I have to ask you, why are you so fearful? Do you have no faith? God's plan also never fails. God's plan can never fail. It gets the job done. It can't and won't be stopped by Satan. God's plan cannot be stopped by your mistakes or your sin. God's plan is not dependent upon you. In fact, there's something I want to encourage you with this morning that you cannot mess up God's plan. He's God. Amen? God's plan will never fail. Why is it you're so fearful? Why do you have no faith? I want you to also understand that God is working out a billion things or more even right now. He's working together everything. I love it when I hear stories. People get up and testify about, you know, how's, how people was that they met and, you know, how God brought them about. Because it's often these little small, minute meetings like years and years and years before that come about to bring in something so glorious later. You know what I'm talking about? God is working a billion things out at once. God's yes and his no's are not contrary to what's best for us but exactly what we need. Even in the storm, he is growing us and working it to our benefit. He's working things out. Scripture says that he's conspiring ways to bring the sinner back unto repentance. You know, he's conspiring. I love that. God is just working things out. A billion things at one time to bring us to where he wants us to be. So why is it that we're so fearful? How is it that we have no faith? God is God. Good. The master is the very one who extended an opportunity for us to grow. He is our only real help. And if we will fall to our knees, we can know that he's in control. His plan will never fail. That he's working out something beautiful in our lives because he is good. He loves you. As the praise team gets ready to come, and we're closing this up. I want to read verse 41. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? There's nothing that God can't do in your life. There's nothing that he can't accomplish. There's no problem so great. There's no storm so large that he can't see you through it. Will you trust him today? Today, will you make a decision to stop being fearful and to have some faith? To put your faith in Christ and know that he is going to see you through to the very end. Will you stand with me? Father, we give you praise. I ask, Lord, if there's anyone in this room that does not know you, Lord, today they'll make that decision, Lord. But for those of us who know you, who have been out there bailing in that boat, trying to, trying to handle this storm on our own, been doing everything we can within our own power to accomplish the task, Lord, I pray today that we'll no longer continue to do so, but we will fall to our knees and cry out to you, our Master, our Maker, our Lord, our Savior, to see us through because you love us and you're in control and you'll guide us and you'll protect us will you come the altar's open